Good morning. We greet you from First Baptist Church here in Port Alberni. Um, Pastor Bill and his wife are away on holiday, so we're uh, asking that you'll watch over them, protect them, and bring them safely back. And our hymn, our uh, preaching this morning will be by Pastor Henry. I'd like to read a couple of verses from Psalm 95 this morning. Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. Let's pray. Our loving Father, we thank you for this opportunity to come to worship you today. We thank you for your love and your care and for your many blessings. Lord, it's been a year that has been very different for us. We know that you're here because you promised that where we are, there you will be also. We commit the service to you. And pray your blessing upon each one that are gathered here in your presence now, whether it's on the computer or wherever we may be listening to you. Thank you, in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I'd like to remind you that uh, we have a drive-in service on Sunday mornings here at First Baptist Church, and we will be coming to you on 89.1 FM that you tune into on your car radio, and you can listen to what's going on in the comfort and convenience of your own car. And again, we remind you, if it's necessary for you to start your car up to keep your battery up, feel free to do so. Now at this time, we will ask the worship team to carry on the rest of the service now. Thank you.
your love is shining in the midst of the darkness shining Jesus lies of the world shine upon us set us free by the truth you now bring us shine on me shine on me shine Jesus shine Of my sins, 
and won the victory. I heard about his healing of his cleansing power, revealing how he made the lame to walk again and cause the blind to see. And then I cried, Dear Jesus. Come and heal my broken spirit And somehow Jesus came and brought To me the victory a time of prayer, we have a few things that we would like to uh, remind you of. Pray for Daphne. She's had this ankle problem. She broke it, and uh, just pray that the Lord will continue to heal her. Teresa is now at home, and she's having help. We just ask the Lord to help her with that as well. And we're thinking of Lydia's weaver's daughter, as she has had some medical issues Pray for the the doctors to look after her. And Greg Collins is now starting a new round of medications. We just pray that God will use those to help Greg through the situation that he's in. Let's pray. Our gracious God and loving Heavenly Father, again we come to you in prayer. We thank you for the privilege that we have of coming to you in this way. We love you, Lord, and we know that you love us. And we bring these folks before you that are struggling, these folks.
folks that are in our congregation. I pray for Daphne, whose her ankle is healing. Uh, she wishes it to heal more quickly. But, Lord, you are in control of all of these things. And I just pray that you'll put your healing hands upon her. And I pray for Teresa as well. Lord, she's home from the hospital, but is still struggling with uh, mobility. I pray for her and for those who are coming in to look after her. And I pray for Lydia Weaver's daughter. She's had some issues in the last while, too that she is in doctor's care. Lord, guide them and help them. Uh, I pray for her that you will bring her back to good health and strength. Pray for Greg Collins as he is in the process of having a new medication. I just pray, Lord, that you will use that to help Greg through this difficult time in his life. And I pray for Heather's wife through this too as she's so very much involved in it. And Lord, continue with us as we meet together this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. The wonderful thing about gathering as the body of Christ, we look for God to speak to us, and he can do that in a number of different ways. It may be a line in a song. It may be something that... He, the God nudges me to say. It may be a prayer. In a lot of ways, different ways, we look for God to speak to us that word which we need to hear today. One of the things that came to my mind this week was the, the idea of perspective. When we, look, when we think of the COVID-19 and the, what we've gone through this past while, and now we're transitioning into a different time, and there are two different, there are probably more than two different perspectives, but at least two. In the, in, there are those that will take the shot, as I have, for the vaccine, I've had my first one, but there are some that are strictly opposed to that. And it's all a matter of how you look at things. We look at the people, I look at the people dying even in India, where 4,000 people are dying a day. That's a, that has definitely affected me. But I can also understand the side that sees the government control in what is allowed and what is not allowed creeping into our everyday life, and we don't like it. So depending on, on our perspective on these issues, depends it'll influence our actions. One of the strongest or biblical perspectives is looking at life uh, in the way that God sees us or trying to move to that point where we see ourselves as God sees us. And probably that comes to me to, in the most clear way in the story of David and Goliath. It's found in 1 Samuel chapter 17. And it's, it's quite a story in itself. We've, we're all familiar with, uh, with the story. David was one of eight bro, uh, sons of a man named Jesse. He was the youngest. The three oldest were in the army already under King Saul. And he was transitioning back and forth between keeping the sheep and trying to sneak in uh, among the soldiers and sometimes bringing them some food to his brothers and back and forth and back and forth quite a bit. The day came when he was 
told by his father to take some more food to his brothers in the army and some cheeses to the commander in charge of the army. And he just happened to, to come there when something was going on. The battle lines were clearly drawn. On one side of the hill were the Philistines. We don't know how many, but probably thousands. And on the other side, across the valley, were the armies of King Saul, the, the soldiers of the Israel army. And David, I'm, I don't know whether he it was his first time there, but he came at just that moment when out of the Philistine army uh, uh, stood up this giant of a man called Goliath. And Goliath uh, challenged the Israeli army, give me a man. What are you, whips or something? Come out to them. If you win and defeat me, we'll be your slaves. If I defeat you, you'll be our slaves. David had never heard this before. The giant spoke in a very arrogant way. He'd probably never lost a battle. Never. Never been defeated. The Bible tells us that he was of a race of giants. Uh, somewhere they're mentioned in about six books of the Bible. Uh, sometimes they're referred to as the Anakim or the Rephaim um, or the Nephilim. So there was a genuine race of giants that were not just big men. They were, in fact, a different race. Uh, uh, they were up a level. They were uh, as big as 10 to 12 feet. Goliath himself was almost 10 feet tall. He wore a, a coat of mail that weighed 150 pounds. His, the iron on his spear weighed 15 pounds. He had armor on his shins, and he had a helmet on, and he had a shield bearer. So he was a formidable, formidable opponent. And it's no wonder, when, when he stood up to challenge the Israeli army, nobody came forward. Of all of the thousands of people in the army of Saul, not a one volunteered to fight Goliath. And Goliath would issue his challenge morning and night for 40 days every day. Give me a man. Come out and fight me. And he came to the point where after issuing his challenge to the Israeli army, he defied the Israeli, the God of the Israeli army. And he was ab abusive, and uh, his, his language was threatening. And David was, happened to, be, to come to the army just at this time, and he heard this man speaking arrogantly and uh, defying the God of Israel and all the Israeli army. And he, David, at first, it bothered him. And he would say, why isn't somebody going up to, to fight Goliath? What will be done for this man that, that uh, rises up and challenges Goliath? And he went around to different people in the army, and one told him this thing and somebody else, but nobody volunteered to go forward and fight Goliath. So finally, the word got through to Saul. 
Um, Saul, if you remember, uh, in the book of Samuel, chapter 9, it says that Saul was head and shoulders above all the people around. So he was a big man. He was a handsome man. And he was a, a strong man. And yet he was afraid. It was his job to fight Goliath. He was supposed to lead the army of Israel to win its battles. That's what the people wanted, but he couldn't deliver. The sight of Goliath made him tremble with fear. And not only him, but the whole army of Israel. So finally, Saul heard some youngster going around and, and speaking uh, about Goliath, and he invited David to come and tell him what, about what he was saying. And David said a number of things, but he said, why isn't there anybody, wasn't there anybody going out to fight this man? He has defied the armies of Israel. He's defied God of Israel the God of Israel. And Saul said, well, everybody's afraid of Goliath. David said, I'm not afraid of Goliath. I'll fight him for you. And I will go out and I will deliver him. I will cut off his head and deliver him. Saul said to David, you don't know what you're talking about. Goliath has been a a warrior since his youth. He's a strong man. He's a, he's a, it would even be impossible for you to, to fight him. So David turned to, to Saul and he said, I was keeping the sheep of, Israel, of my father and the bear took one of the lambs and I slew that bear. I grabbed him by the beard and then at another time, a lion came and took one of the lambs. And again, I grabbed him and fought him and defeated him. And this Goliath, this giant, will be like one of those. I'm not afraid of this man. He has defied God. And something in David's tone and voice convinced Saul that he should give David a chance. But here's where this perspective comes in again. Saul thought that the only way that David had a chance to defeat Goliath was if he gave him armor and a sword and fought him as you normally would uh, see uh, a confrontation like this. And he, he put this armor on Saul, on David, and the helmet on, and David said something along the lines of, I can't use these. These are too big. Just, I'm not comfortable wearing them. I can't, I can't fight Goliath like this. Well, some, I'm sure that everybody else or all around him said, thought, what in the world is he going to do next? What's he going to fight with? And David took up his sling and five, five stones, and he said, with these, I'm going to fight Goliath. When Goliath saw David approaching him, he just roared at him and ridiculed him and he said what am I a dog that somebody would uh, come to me and with sticks I'll feed your flesh to the birds David answered him he said no I'm the one that's going to feed you to the birds of the air and the Bible says that David ran, he ran to fight Goliath. And 
as far as we know, the very first stone he had, he swung it and he hit the giant hard enough that the stone lodged deeply in Goliath's head and he fell to the ground. And David ran for, took Goliath's sword and defeat and kills him. The Israeli army pursued. And I think everybody was shocked that this little man, and David was probably a teenager at the time, would defeat their champion, Goliath. Nobody thought that this would be the outcome. And their perspective changed immediately. And the Israeli army pursued the Philistines and overcame them. And uh, David won a great victory that day. Um, when we think about that, again, the idea of the perspective arises. In the earthly mindset um, was one thing. There was a fear of meeting, of being unsuccessful in the confrontation with Goliath. And yet David had a different mindset. And when he came forward, he said, I'll do to this one as I did to the bear and to the lion. I'm not afraid. I will come in the, I come to Goliath in the name of the Lord of hosts. And that's a different mindset than of all the soldiers, including Saul. And that perspective, uh, I'd like to pursue that a little bit as we, as, as we consider that element ourselves. Do we have an earthly mindset or do we have a heavenly mindset? In the book of Ephesians, it talks about that we are seated with Christ in the heavenlies. Let me read it for you. In Ephesians chapter 1 and uh, verses, verses 20 and following. Uh, it says, which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every name that is named, above every title that, be con that, that can be conferred, not only in this age, and in this world, but also in the age and the world which are to come. And he has put all things under his feet and has appointed him the universal and supreme head of the church, which is his body, the fullness who, of him who fills all in all. For in that body lives the full measure of him who makes everything complete and who fills everything everywhere with himself. That is a, are also, those are awesome words. And then how often is it that we would think of ourselves in those terms? That we are seated with him, in him. As he is on the throne, angels and, and every authority being subject to him, far above all principality and power and dominion and every name that can be named, every title that men might have. We, don't, we seldom see ourselves with this kind of a heavenly mindset. And yet, we need, God wants to draw us to that mindset. 
that we are seated with Christ. We don't seem to have a problem with uh, that passage in Colossians chapter 2, where it says that we are buried with him by baptism into death. But those are really two sides of the same coin. On the one side, we see a baptism into his death. On the other side, we see him raised to life and, and ourselves in him, seated on the throne, uh, far above all principality and power. We seldom, or if ever, think of ourselves in those terms. We have verses in scripture that say that in Christ we are a new creation or new creatures. In Romans it says that we are more than conquerors. I don't know fully uh, if we know what that means. We know in this life that we wrestle. Now, and uh, Ephesians says that our wrestling isn't with flesh and blood but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in the heavenly places. So we have a way of, uh, the, of looking at the things that come in, before us in life. On the one hand, we can look at the things in our, heaven, in our earthly mindset whether it's um, a matter of finances or disease or things that come up, problems in our work used to come up, but how often will, will, will we look at those same things from a, uh, from a heavenly perspective? Let me give you another scripture. Back in 2 Kings chapter 6 and uh, verses 16 and 17, we have the story of Elisha and his servant. And the servant and the armies were approaching them and the servant was getting nervous. And he's, he turned to Elijah and he said, Oh Lord, oh Lord, my Lord, what are we going to do? And we have these incredible verb, words from Elisha. He calmly says, those that are with us are more than are with them. The servant didn't see anybody. And I think that we have the same problem. We don't see God's invisible army on our side. And all that we see is the approaching threat of problems that are, some are just big men and some are giants. And, but the perspective that we have at that moment is everything. Elisha saw clearly that those who were with him were more than all the armies that were threatening. And I think we need to see that. We need to look at our problems in that same way. That we need to not just focus or be focused on the human point of view where we see our problems as our human uh, threatening. In 1 Kings chapter 19 and verse 35, we see something of the power that is on our side. Where it says, the angel of the Lord slew that night 185,000 soldiers. And it, the, in the morning when uh, the commanders got up, there was nothing but 
bodies everywhere, 185,000, he realized that he was in the presence of superior forces. And that's the mindset that God wants us to have, to see ourselves in Christ's victory, to see ourselves on a throne, to see ourselves in the midst of those uh, superior forces of heaven. And God wants us to, to look at life that way. In the book of Philippians, it says, in nothing terrified by your enemy. In 1 John chapter 4, it says, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. In the book of Timothy, in 2 Timothy chapter 1, it says, we have not received the spirit of fear, but of a love and of a sound mind. And as we have already said, that God considers us and he has written us that we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. There are, are important, these are important differences for us. These are an important mindset for us that uh, we have in Christ Jesus, that our enemies are ones that are not as great as we think they are, but they're enemies that God has given us already victory over. We need to learn to see from our heavenly perspective that we are in Christ and we are God that's the way that God sees us that we are not um, nothing to be ashamed of God is not ashamed of us God does not think of us uh, in the least bit inferior but he sees us in Christ and all of our failures, all of our things that we think about, they're not there anymore. We're transported in Christ, and that's all that God sees. He sees us in him and with him. And the enemy is an utterly defeated foe. The whole book of Ephesians is tells us that we are in Christ, with Christ, in Christ, in Christ Jesus. Over and over, it's trying to establish us in the mindset of victory, or victory won in Christ, that, uh, that somehow we need to, to get up into. God wants us to rise up and see the enemy from a different view point than, than we are used to see him. Instead of looking up at the giant problems we face, and some of them are giants, when we think of big tech or big diseases or big government, we have a tendency to look up at our enemies and it bothers us. God says, you're looking at things the wrong way. Look down that you are seated in Christ far, far above principalities and powers and everything that can come your way. And we have to get used to seeing things in a different perspective, from Christ's perspective, from God's perspective, that so that we do not fear those things that are before us and those things that may come our way. The Bible is full of encouragement for us to adopt or to learn to see life in this perspective. 
how you and I see things will be uh, very influential in what we do next. And my prayer and my desire is that God will draw each of us, all of us, up into that heavenly mindset where we see things from his perspective, where we see things in the terms of victory won. Not that we won it, but that Christ won it. And that we share in his victory. We have joint seating with Christ. And we need to learn to think that way. Let's pray together. Our Father, as we bow before you, we know that we have difficulty with this. We see the giants and it, it causes us to have weak knees. It causes us to fear and we shouldn't. And except that you give us that mindset, that you enable us to see things the way you see them, that we can rise above our fears, that we can face the giants in our life and in our world and not be afraid because we see ourselves in the victory that Jesus has won once and for all, for all of us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Yeah.
I like Pastor Bill's reference to the fact that God is ha, can keep us from falling and to present us glorious in his presence without shame, without fear, and with great joy. So unto God we, we look to him for his blessing upon us all, that he would enable us to see as he sees us. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, now and forevermore. Amen.